I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the homeless. I think a lot of people think that people are homeless by choice. On a cold night last winter, nearly 1,000 people in Aurora spent the night on a friend's sofa, in a motel, a shelter, or literally on the street. Most of them not by choice. They're part of the ever-changing population of homeless and those at risk. First, join our Dateline Aurora cameras on a mission like no other, under bridges and along the South Platte River. It's a rare chance to see these hidden homes and meet those committed to helping. Outreach, we got supplies, hygiene, first aid, hello. I don't like knowing that that's home for someone. Then, how do you go from being a military veteran to a corporate hotshot to homeless in a matter of months? You'll hear this woman's stunning story. Hello, I'm your Dateline Aurora host, Wendy Brockman. Thank you for joining us. We're here with a real look at homelessness, who's on the brink and who's helping. It'll change the way you see that person with a sign on the street corner. Dateline Aurora starts now. It's no secret we've seen it, our neighbors with no place to call home. Our economy's improving and unemployment is the lowest in a decade, but there's a flip side. With rising home values, higher rent fees, and an all-time low vacancy rate for rentals, affordable housing is hard to find. It's a concern here in Aurora, across Colorado, and the nation. What if you lose your job or find one that pays a lot less than your previous one? Some of our veterans are returning home to find they can no longer pay the bills. And this may surprise you, many young adults are suffering. One out of every six homeless people in Aurora is between 18 and 24 years old. So what is our city doing about it? Honestly, a lot. I'm joined by two people who are in the know. James Gillespie is the passion behind Comitus Crisis Center, Aurora's only homeless shelter. And Signe Makita is a community development planner with the city of Aurora and author of many of our neighborhood plans. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Pat. What does homelessness look like right now in our community, James? Well, you know, if you go home right now and you Google homeless man or homeless person, what's gonna pop up generally is that middle-aged man unshaven, dirty face. Uh, you can imagine what he smells like. And the reality is uh, many of the members in the Aurora community, many of our friends and neighbors are only one paycheck away. So at Comitus Crisis Center, we currently serve mostly single women with multiple children, and we also have a lot of homeless youth in our area as well. Signe, we've heard this is a funded priority with Mayor Hogan and the City Council. How is the city responding? Well, the city is responding by making it one of its top dozen priorities. And we have put in not only federal resources, federal funds to help uh, shelters, but we're also putting uh, financially and staff into it as well. We're looking at addressing non-unsheltered people by sending our police in a van during cold weather nights to bring people in from the cold. We're working closely with Comitus to increase their sheltering capacity. We're also looking to rapidly rehouse families and prevent homelessness. And then in the long run, we're looking to increase affordable housing opportunities. It's a lot to tackle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Our Dateline producer, Jenny Castor, had a unique opportunity to join the Comitus 180 Street Outreach Team on a weekly check of the common hangouts for homeless youth in the metro area. You won't believe where they go and what they see. And the day begins. It's a Thursday, oh, and Jay Reynolds, Caitlin Arce, yeah. and Kashmir Wilkins Coleman are loading up the van. Super duper amount of hygiene kits. My backpack has hats, gloves, lots of socks. We call socks white gold on the street. Sleeping bag just in case we run across somebody that really needs a sleeping bag. Dateline Aurora cameras are going too. Let's go ahead and load up and hit the streets. We have very unusual jobs. <laughs> we go places nor normal people wouldn't go. That's because they're checking out hidden homeless youth hangouts. We'll go to one of our spots that has a higher volume 
First stop, Washington Street near I-70. The bridges along metro area highways are common hangouts for homeless camps. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the homeless. And we see the kids that had no idea that this was going to be their life and are completely unprepared. Hey, how you doing today? Here's a water. Did you want a snack? Outreach. We got supplies. Hygiene. First aid. Hello. You'll say it like five times and then someone finally warms up or says, you know what, I do need something. And they'll come out and you're like, oh, hey. Street outreach. No stone unturned. Some of them I can see myself. If I was on the streets, I would would be okay living there. And so that one felt really uncomfortable. It was damp and dark and scary. It was scary. This trio is part of the Comitus Crisis Center here in Aurora. They lead the 180 Street Outreach Team, bringing resources to the streets. So obviously someone was there at one point. Where homeless and runaway youth often need it most. People don't realize how huge our, our population of youth who are homeless are. There's over, well over a thousand and that's just what we could count. So I'll leave this. It's a powerful way to make direct contact with anyone living on the streets. If we kept traveling for about a quarter mile along this path right here, um, there's camps back there. Anybody back here? We got some supplies. I'm Jay. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Yeah, here you go. You guys are feeling like you need to get into shelter. Um, we don't turn anybody away. Everybody and anybody's welcome to come get shelter. For some, it is just the caring gesture they need to get life back on track and seek resources. Our mission is mainly to get the resources into the right hands. It worked for Kashmir. She was homeless just last year and is now a peer counselor with Comitis. It's like you look at me and I tell you like my full life story, which is pretty traumatic and everywhere I've lived. And then you see like I'm, I'm a happy person for the most part. There is no one face of homelessness. People could have been homeless for a night or a year and we still honestly can't tell. Many Aurora homeless youth travel to Denver to spend the day. This group goes there too. Hey guys, street outreach. They honestly, they help out a whole lot. At the end of this day, trust has been earned and dozens of lives helped. Well, having a heart and a passion to do this, it's not a job, it's um, really a calling. It's a beneficial job because you get to help a lot of people. Hmm. It's just so tragic to see that. So how do you really gauge the numbers and the need out there? Well, there's a survey done every year in Aurora and across the metro area called Point in Time. And as we talk, we're going to show statistics from the most recent results to help get a better grasp of the issue. So James, what is the survey? The Point in Time survey happens in communities all across the country. And for our Colorado-based community, it's Denver, in the metro area. And basically volunteers go out and they go out to every homeless shelter in the Denver metro area as well as hit the streets. And they have a very simple survey and it's a self-report. And the homeless report back to us, what are your greatest needs? How large is your family? Why are you homeless? And how long have you been homeless? So how does this help the city to have this information, Signe? Well, what we find out was we try to tailor our programs and our funding towards the populations that need it. Um, although we want to make sure, for instance, six, uh, let's say two thirds of our homeless are within families with children. Uh, so we do have a lot of programs geared towards families. However, we do want to make sure, for instance, that we have also funded programs for our single adults, the ones that are chronically homeless. We saw when we were showing some of those statistic terms like doubled up or at risk, what does that mean? Well, doubled up is not a roommate situation. It, the, the family or the household is not on the lease and they can be kicked out at any time. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is essentially couch surfing. Doubled up might also mean that um, you may be in several locations um, throughout a month. You might be unsheltered one day in a motel the next and then staying with a family or friend who may, who may kick you out. None of it is stable. No. So Comitus was at 96% capacity last year. That's, That's right. 50,000 shelter nights. How is the city helping you guys cope with that? Uh, can I tell you, the city of Aurora has been a partner a real partner. So uh, if anyone's ever skeptical about government, they hear something's a priority and that's all well and good. But the next question in well is usually, hey, is it a funded?
priority. And at least from the Comitis side, we're happy to see that the city is putting some real meat on the bones when it comes to addressing uh, the needs of the homeless here in our community, uh, helping to, uh, for example, the Comitis shelter has uh, capital needs. It's, a, it's an older building, all the way to helping with services. Uh, the city's partnered from the mayor uh, to the city council to the incredible staff who work really hard and they address homelessness not because they're told by elected officials that they're addressing homelessness, they're addressing it because they actually believe in their community, they care for their neighbors, and you see passion in the city staff that is uh, much, uh, uh, goes well beyond the, the status quo. Sydney, you were saying rent is up 20%? It's that's, amazing. That's crazy. It has gone to $900 for a one bedroom, almost $1,200 for a two bedroom. That's higher than some people's mortgage. Sure. We have seen vacancy rates because Aurora has some of the more affordable housing in the metro area is actually the lowest. It was at 0% this quarter. We have, we've had families going and looking at 140, 150 units and won't find landlords that will take them. So even if they have a job, they can't find anything, so they're either forced to double up, sometimes live in motels. Motels can be at, um, we've heard people spending $1,500 a month on a, mot on a one bedroom, not even a one bedroom, on a, a, essentially a studio with no kitchen facilities. Mm -hmm. Some people are paying more for a motel room than they are for a two, three bedroom apartment. So how can the city address that immediately and then say five years down the road? Okay, so as, as um, we are looking at the at the unsheltered, we are looking at sending out a van to, to find those unsheltered uh, with our police department and our partners. We're looking at increasing our sheltering capacity. We've helped Comitas go from 100 to 140 beds, but that still isn't enough. It's not enough. It isn't. So we're also looking, there are no vacant units out there. Uh, so we're looking at potentially group homes. We're also working for um, long-term solutions to build more units. And James and myself and other partners have worked with the governor's office to build more permanent supportive housing with the toolkit. All right. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, two powerful stories from female veterans, one who lost it all in the recession and the other receives an award at the White House thanks to the work she's done here. We'll be right back. Oh, look, a redhead <gasps> staring contest. Got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Welcome back. This is Dateline Aurora. We're digging deep into the real issues of homelessness. It impacts all of us, and many are teetering on the brink as we speak. Surprisingly, those who've sacrificed to serve our country are falling into this category. 12% of Aurora's homeless are veterans, and that's the case across the metro area. We are joined by two veterans. Leanne Wheeler is a U.S. Air Force Desert Storm veteran, and Dana Nimala is a U.S. Navy vet. You are manager of veteran services for the city of Denver and just earned the prestigious White House Champion of Change Award. Thank you, ladies, both for your service to this country, first of all. Leanne, you were a defense contractor for Raytheon, True. top of the corporate ladder, and then it all came crashing down. What happened? It's all true. Uh, the recession happened, okay. quite frankly, and over time, I just didn't do a very good job of stewarding the well, the well earned income that I was making. Uh, the bottom fell out, and uh, when I went to engage systems to get back on track, I found some difficulty doing so. It doesn't take long, does it? That no, surprises it people, I think, to hear that. It, it was surprising to me, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So, you, if you don't have that little bit of a nest egg, and then things turn, you have nothing. You have nothing. So where are you now? I now have the privilege of owning my own businesses, actually, and I'm working in the outreach veteran space, uh, partnered with some of the folks here uh, on the panel, as a matter of fact. Um, it's been a slow road to recovery. I certainly don't enjoy the lifestyle I used to enjoy. 
Uh, but I am hopeful that uh, we can get some changes in place th so that not only I recover fully, but those who are transitioning have the same type of opportunities that I have. You're just not what you would think of as falling into the homeless category. I need, do people need to open their eyes and realize this affects everyone? Absolutely, Wendy. Actually, James hit it uh, on the head. As I was traversing the systems that were in place, I learned quickly that they were, in fact, looking for a certain profile, uh, not only of veteran, but of homeless veteran. And so a lot of what I encountered was um, they were wa brick walls, walls that I had to overcome and saying, listen, I, I'm not that profile. I, I, I had a living, a good living. I'm not addicted to anything. I'm not, you know, I, I don't have... Uh, uh, alcohol abuse problems, drug abuse problems. I simply ran out of money. And so what I need to have happen now are these things. And the way the systems were set up, they couldn't accommodate those things as they were aligned for the typical profile of homeless veteran. And so I wasn't able to take advantage of the majority of the programs that are in place for veterans currently. Wow, I bet there are a lot of other people, exact same situation. True. So Dana, we don't really have boundaries with this issue. It's not an Aurora issue or a Denver issue, it's metro-wide. So tell us about the work you do in Denver that helps all veterans. You know, it's interesting, Leanne mentioned, um, not looking like the typical homeless veteran. And I think the diversity of our population is something that people don't really understand. And that includes a geographic diversity. The, the individuals that we're seeing at the Denver County Veteran Service Office come from the seven county metro area. And thankfully, we're in a position to be able to serve all of those who come in seeking services from us. It really is boundaryless, very customer focused, because we recognize that not everybody meets that profile of what you think a homeless individual or, or a veteran looks like. And so all of our services are geared towards meeting the individual where they are and then customizing the case management and the services around that to meet their individual needs and what the individual identifies as their priorities. So help us understand the needs of a veteran returning home. It's, it's really varied. Um, when it comes to returning home, it depends on what you mean. If it's coming back from war, the services are going to be reflective of reintegrating with the community. If it's returning home to a home they haven't had in a while because they've been chronically homeless, those services are going to look a lot different. Very highly customized. I think the most important thing to know is that the Denver metro community as a whole really rallies around the homeless veterans around, uh, around the metro area. And there's a multitude of services and a lot of entry points for it. And so what, I, what I'm really proud of the work that the city and county of Denver is doing through their veteran service office is connecting all of those dots. We don't own the solution to this particular problem. But what we do have, what the strength of our solution to the problem is in the strength of our partnerships with our fellow agencies, nonprofit organizations, the city of Aurora, Comitus Crisis Center, Volunteers of America is a huge partner of ours in really rallying all of these resources together to meet the need so that the veteran doesn't have to be wandering around trying to figure out where to go next. So Leanne, have you seen that support out there for you and your fellow vets? And so now, so in, in fairness, my experience and journey is about seven, eight years old. Uh, so there's been a significant change. And so I will um, uh, call out, actually, the Homeless Veteran Reentry Program. There's been a change in leadership in Dana's um, purview. Um, there's been changes in the programmatics. Uh, I believe that had I had that particular program to access in the beginning, my experience would have been different. And so I think it took us a while as a community to unravel what needed to happen get the right people in place, those who, who knew what to look for, and how to create partnership. And so we're seeing more of that now, absolutely. What do you th think we need to still do? I think we need to pull in private sector and I, as, as an underutilized resource, uh, and the faith community, quite frankly, as an underutilized resource. And so um, we've not done a very good job, I think, as a community, and that's all of us, not certainly the people who are looking at the problem now, but cur currently, but as a society, um, we don't have the public will to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Denver Foundation actually just launched a public will campaign. I have the privilege of serving with that body. Um, how do we engage faith? How do we engage private sector, uh, one, one community at a time, until we are in fact all with a public will to solve the problem? And so um, I believe those are the two facets that are missing, is, is faith and bi private business. 
James, how does uh, Comitas Crisis Center help women and families? Well, we're a grant and per diem partner with the VA. So what that means is if you're homeless uh, and you've been discharged in any way except dishonorably discharged, we can bring in uh, the female veteran who we prefer, uh, the spouse and all of their children, and we'll give them a room with the bathroom for free for two entire years. Uh, that said, uh, it, it's difficult because the per diem only pays for the occupancy and cost of the veteran alone, but doesn't cover, for example, the veteran's dependent children who are growing out of their clothes in that two-year time. And we're really asking that uh, government uh, step up and take a look at maybe a subsidy for those dependent children of that homeless female veteran to help her along in her journey, but also keep the kids' lives normalized as they're in school as well. We're hearing so many problems with affordable housing just contributing to the problem. The city um, sees the need for veterans to have affordable housing as well, don't they, Signe? That's right, we do. Um, part of the governor's toolkit that James and I took part in, we are looking to build permanent supportive housing and we are looking to give a preference for veteran families in one of our projects that we're doing. We're also taking a look at whether um, we can do some group homes. Uh, for instance, our Aurora Mental Health Center has a group home for veterans and we're constantly looking for more, uh, they're constantly looking for more real estate opportunities. However, unfortunately, they're getting bid out by um, investors on some of these homes. Um, so we are trying to tackle it. It's just the market and uh, the growth that's happening here has has made it, in some cases, slow. But we're persevering and we're gonna try and get a pipeline, a systematic pipeline where we can get affordable housing, hopefully about 100 units built per year. It's difficult because you were saying renters have the option of turning away whoever they want. They can, they can pick from a choice of applicants and someone who's been homeless or may have a criminal history, you know, oh, I'm not gonna, pick them, I'm gonna go with the med student. That's right, we're, we're seeing anyone that's had an eviction on their record is going to have just a barrier for probably the rest of their life, anyone with a conviction. Um, anyone that's um, had uh, substance abuse issues might, um, and anything that's gonna show up on their credit history, those are gonna be barriers that family or that household has to face. So in this very selective market, what we're trying to do is we're doing a landlord recruitment campaign with the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. We're gonna be partnering with them. We're also looking to, um, if, to build more housing because if we ourselves can have partners that are the landlord, that accept the clients as they are, that provide support. We've partnered with uh, Comitis on one of our projects and they'll actually bringing, be bringing in supportive services as well as mental health services um, to our clients in these residences so that they will be uh, self-sufficient and they won't relapse. And the issues that landlords have sh really shouldn't be a problem. Dana, tell us about your White House Award. <laughs> Actually, the, the White House Award centers around the types of partnerships that we build in the city and county of Denver through our Veteran Services Program. That was the, what the recognition was for. Um, I think in the work that we've done, we've recognized that the problem of homelessness is a very complicated problem and requires very comprehensive solutions. And no single agency can be the, the defining answer to that problem. So we really need to, to rally the resources and make use of the benefits of the VA um, where applic applicable. Um, our community resource partners in Volunteers of America and Comitis, um, and, and really bring those together. And that's what we do in, in our veteran services program with the city and county of Denver, is making sure that we're making effective use of all of those um, to connect individuals to the behavioral health resources that they need so that they're able to get primary care to make sure that they're seeing a doctor if they have medical issues, which is a significant barrier to reintegration for homeless individuals, um, and that they're able to access livable wages. Um, every person who has worn the uniform is entitled to a livable wage and to be able to earn the right to a roof over their head. And it's from that foundation of self-sufficiency that we operate and we build those partnerships. James, a final question. I think a lot of us wonder this. When we see that person holding up the sign, what do we do? Do we give them money? 
Uh, it's a tough question, right? Because you want to feel good. You want to give that person a dollar and drive away and go, I made a difference. But if you really take a look at the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative point in time survey, you'll see that about 50% or so of the homeless have reported back to us that we really do need substance abuse and mental health services. We're not trying to stigmatize that group, but we're also really wanting to um, empower, right, and, and not enable. So what that means is if you give a dollar to somebody, I would say 50% of the time you're gonna get it right. And I would encourage you to uh, uh, look at their signs if they're asking for money for food, give them food. Uh, if they're asking for money for clothes, give them clothes. If they need a job, employ them. Uh, you know, figure it out and meet those needs. But at the end of the day, homeless providers, we know what we call um, the frequent flyers. We also know the folks that are disenfranchising the community from caring about homelessness because you know, they're gonna pack up their wheelchair and throw it in the back of the Mercedes and head off to Florida on your dime. So we wanna be pragmatic and compassionate. So we, I would encourage the public to really think about addressing the true need and taking a more thoughtful look at what they're doing a little longer than in the time of a red light. At Signe, there are other ways to make a donation. There sure are. The city, um, we have partnered with a number of agencies in Aurora, Comitis Crisis Center, Colfax Community Network, Aurora Mental Health, Arapaho House. We have a list of 25 to 30 agencies that in some way directly or indirectly help uh, provide homeless and at-risk ser services. So just as we financially are contributing, we do hope um, individuals can do that as well because it, it can't just be the, the government um, sector taking part, it has to be community taking part. Leanne, when you see those people out there with the signs, what do you do? I'll tell you that uh, I read the signs. Do you? And I am very aware if I've seen them before. Mm. And so I roll down the window and ask, what, what is it that you need? Where did you sleep last night? Where do you plan to sleep tonight? Is this money gonna be, moved, be used toward that or something else? Um, there was one woman that I've seen in the same place for a couple of days in a row. I had not seen her before. And so this particular day I asked her, have you eaten? And so um, she said she had not, and so I went and, and brought her lunch. Mm -hmm. Now with that, um, uh, I brought her what I would eat. You know, I, I, I think that where, where we're losing it as a society and public will is what we need, they need. And I would do for them what I would do for myself. And so um, that's the way I approached it. She thanked me for it and she was out there again. Uh, but she remembered me. Mm -hmm. And so um, the veterans that I see, I, I ensure that they've been registered with the VA. If, if they um, don't know if they qualify for benefits or not, I refer them to 3030 Downing Street. Um, if they're not sure of their discharge status, I actually refer them to the city and county of Denver to the HBRP program, um, give them the address, um, and uh, if I see them again, I ask them how that went. Mm. And so there's, there's some level of mutual accountability I've taken on as a private citizen and having found myself homeless um, and as a compassionate human being to say, I, I see you, I see you have need. If I can give you something that will meet that need, I'm happy to, and if I cannot, I'll refer you to where you might get it. And I think we all have a role to play there. So how has all this changed you? Uh, I get weepy thinking about Do it. You? I am no longer the same person. Yeah. How could you be? I'm, I'm not. You've seen a yeah. side of life yeah. that must be terrifying. I'll tell you the irony of it, Wendy, is that when I was living the corporate life, my other life, I was leading homeless ministry for my church. And I didn't have uh, any sense of what was really happening. I didn't know where they came from. I didn't know where they went. Um, it was something I did two, three days out of the month. It wasn't until it happened to me that, that it changed me. Well, we're glad that you've come out the other side and now can uh, share your wisdom with all of us, as privilege. you guys have done here today. Dana, James, Signe, and Leanne, thank you, thank you so much for an honest conversation. Thank you all for being here. Dateline Aurora plans to continue this discussion in the months ahead on tap long-term housing solutions from Governor Hickenlooper's homeless initiatives. That's all for this edition of Dateline Aurora. Be sure to watch us online and on the web at youtube.com forward slash the Aurora channel.